limited transphobic term. <laughs> by the, um, the haters last year when I became my own trigger warning. <laughs> Before then, student unions and so-called feminist societies and LGBTQQIPMQ, whatever, would send out um, trigger warning, uh, transphobia, homophobia, etc. Julie Bindle has written this article, you should see it, but be warned. And then I was told by a student, one of the very many feminist students whose lives are made hell by this, that an email came out and all he said was trigger warning Julie Bindle. <laughs> <laughs> so delighted, of course. Um, I'm officially no platformed by the National Union of Students, the NUS. Um, I think they should probably be known as no understanding or sense. Um, so, uh, obsolete and pointless organisation, uh, full of bellends, <laughs> even the women. And in their last motion to no platform me, they had this great, very intelligent, mature discussion at one of their conferences, and the motion just read, Julie Binder is vile. And that was the motion. And in fact, what was really very, very upsetting to me was that they spelt my name wrong. <laughs> so they couldn't even get that bit right. The history briefly is, in 2003, I wrote a long article for the uh, Sunday Telegraph magazine. But it didn't go online, because the magazine doesn't go online. And it was the first article that had been written from a feminist point of view in the UK that looked at those who deeply regret going through the process uh, of, of surgery and hormones. And I interviewed um, a male to female trans person, Claudia, who was a young gay, sexually abused man who was encouraged and then coerced into transitioning. And eventually Claudia sued, was, was one of the trans people who regrets this process, who sued Russell Reed, who is a psychiatrist that would quite frankly diagnose a German shepherd as transgender, <laughs> if the money was forthcoming. So Russell Reed uh, was, was um, no longer allowed to practice. These voices are silenced, and we, we mustn't forget that, that there are voices of people who regret this process, who do not hate feminism, they do not hate women, they do not hate us, but they have been literally left with nowhere to go. In 2004, I wrote a column um, in Garden Weekend magazine, which was based on the, the absolutely stunningly brilliant feminist organisation Vancouver Rape Relief who had fought a long and valiant and extremely feminist battle. When I say feminist, by the, mean, by the way, I mean radical feminist, because although we know there are many types of feminism, most of them are wrong. So I'm just <laughs> going to... to short break that. I had read that Vancouver Rape Relief had won um, a court case that almost had the organisation shut down because they refused to allow Kimberly Nixon a transgender man, to counsel rape survivors. So, it all began, everybody. And from then on, um, there was literally Sheila Jeffries, Janice Raymond, and myself, with a little bit of Mary Daly on occasion, who were the transphobic feminists, who were banned, no platformed, vilified, lied about, bullied, cancelled, etc. And the reason why I say there was a really small group of us back in 2004 isn't in any way to say, aren't we special snowflakes? <laughs> Won't we brave? It's to actually say that at the time, such was the fear that was instilled, even in radical feminists, that the vast majority of radical feminists 
refused to do anything publicly to support us. And I mean women who are my friends. Not my close friends, obviously, but women who are good feminists. Women who should know better. I have been told since then by feminists who certainly should know better, who share our policies and politics, that they can't put me on the programme at their conference because it might get the venue shut down. That would I come and speak, but can they not advertise my name beforehand in case there's a picket? Now, I didn't take this personally. Because it's not personal, it's not about me or Sheila or Jan or Julia or any of us here. It's about the absolute hatred of radical feminism. But these feminists should do better. It's not all right to say, if we don't, if we put you on the programme, we might lose the support of the NUS. We might lose our funding. Do it without the funding. Do it at another venue. Because had there not been women in our movement brave enough to eventually be enough of a group to get to the stage where events like this and prior to this could happen, we would still be in the same shit time we were in back in 2004 or before then. <clears throat> and that isn't all right. And it's not the way we should do feminism. And we're leaving behind young women in universities who are desperate, absolutely desperate, to be out and proud radical feminists and cannot do this in the male-led or trans-friendly or, or sex worker-friendly feminist societies or LGBTQ societies or even women's liberation societies. And the way that we know that this is anti-radical feminism rather than just that really these trans people have been so bullied and vilified we have to take a stand and support them is because it's always about three things. It's about the sex trade, it's about Islam, and it's about transgenderism. They're always the three things. And they are utterly indivisible to these cultural relativists, to the feminist haters, and to those who literally have not exercised their brain to think for themselves. Now I'm going to read you um, an edited email exchange. <clears throat> that a student sent to me, a great radical feminist student, who if she spoke out, I mean she probably would end up being thrown off her course, but she's, she's actively organising, and good for her. So I was invited to speak at the worst place in London, which is Soas. Right? It is the worst. They're called female genital mutilation cutting. They think sex work is great, and anyone that dares criticise the veil, or Islamic practices towards women, including women who are Muslim born, they go berserk, you're Islamophobic. So they are the worst. Anyway, one of the feminists invited me to speak about the sex trade. <laughs> and then the email came out, trigger warning. Islamophobia, anti-sex work, transphobia, biphobia, transmissendry, and essentialism. Yeah. And you do have to laugh. <laughs> essentialism. And then they listed all of my crimes, which were articles that I published in various magazines and, and newspapers. And the first one, of course, was Gender Benders Beware. We don't choose the title, but you know. Anyway, uh, that was the 2004 one. I'm just going to read you a line from my article, because I actually do think it's really funny. Think about a world inhabited just by transsexuals. It would look like the set of Greece. <laughs> And then I go on to say I don't have a problem with men disposing of their genitals, but it doesn't make them women. So that was the first example, and then there were various other examples. Sex change surgery is unnecessary mutilation. And then we go on to bisexuality, which I can hardly be bothered with. <laughs> I just said, what's the point of them? Like most of us do, right? I know there'll be bisexuals in the room, but whatever. <laughs> That's part by hating. And then there was queer, I'm a queer hater apparently, because I once said it was anyone that was into kinky sex because I was pissed and I was being very lazy about it, but it's probably true. And then there was one about feminism and women, and it was a tweet um, from these really anti-feminist women who want to stop feminists doing our work. And I said, well these women um, who want to uh, hold feminist progress should be paid less than men, have no maternity benefits, no access to refuges, and no vote. You see the point I was trying to make? Right? And that was anti-feminism. This is just a joke. It does keep me amused. And then there was homophobia. 
Um, and this is the offending line that they choose to put. And I wrote, rather than society pre pretending it's a career choice, prostitution needs to be exposed for what it is, violence against women. <laughs> And then, um, Islamophobia. <coughs> um, oh no, no, we'll, we'll have a little bit of amnesty first. Um, I said amnesty <laughs> tries to pretend that women selling their bodies is similar to forms of labour. <coughs> that was as well. Islamophobia, I said, if, um, I've spoken to many formerly Muslim feminists. The veil, its presence should be challenged as a threat to the freedom of women, not celebrated as a harmless aspect of multiculturalism. I mean, loads of women say this, right? But it's radical feminism, isn't it? It's those of us that refuse to capitulate to the identity politics that is liberal or fond of feminism. This is the point. So then, um, this really good um, feminist uh, so has challenged this, let's just call it male head of the LGBTQ society at Soros. And she said this is pure anti-feminism. And he wrote back and said, I appreciate that Julie Bickle is not alone in holding many of these views. However, as you acknowledge, she is perhaps most unique in the way she aggressively talks about trans people. I should also make clear that I'm not um, uninformedly opposed to all of Bindle's views, but the point is that she does contravene our safe space policy because of trans students, and because of Muslim students, queer students, bi students, and sex working students. Right, so I then asked her, had she ever seen a woman in a veil who identified as bisexual, who was also a sex worker and transgender. And she said, no, she hadn't really. And I asked her if she knew who it was that was speaking for Muslim-born women, for, for trans people, for bisexual identified people, um, all the rest. And she said, it's, it's pretty much white men and some very posh white women who are their allies. So this is, this is the deal in its identity politics. Um, so I don't really know what else to say. I mean, she has told me, and other students that I've interviewed, have told me that manifestos written by feminists who are trying to get elected as women's liberation officers, or lesbian officers, you know, have had their posters torn down and defaced in universities for being transphobic and homophobic and Islamophobic, despite the fact that they haven't even mentioned any of these issues. They've spoken about patriarchy and male supremacy. They know what underpins this. They know how important the issue of religious fundamentalism is, of prostitution and the sex trade, and of gender as a social construct and as punishment to women and girls. They know this. It's pure anti-radical feminism. Um, there was one woman who was kicked out of uh, the editorial of a grotesque um, online magazine called Country Living, spelt differently from country, right? Uh, they think they're so edgy and cool. Little do they know that the Scots have been saying this for rather a long time. <laughs> as a comma. Um, and she was told that she was homophobic and that she supported survivors like my good friend and colleague Rachel Moore and, um, and they all lie. She was told, all, all these survivors, they all lie, they haven't been in the sex trade, and if they have, it wasn't a terrible thing, they'd just be paid by nuns to... Um, <laughs> to <laughs> she was thrown out of the editorial despite the fact she was a formerly prostituted woman. She said this, they knew it all along, but they said she was still homophobic because she didn't support her sex working student sisters. So, the last time that I was on no a platform from a university, because I accept all invitations now, and in fact I'm a visiting research fellow on, at Lincoln and they forget to turn up for that when I go and teach there and things. Um, the last time was when I was debating pornography with uh, a porn producer called uh, Jerry Barnett, is that right? Absolute, utter misogynistic bellend. And uh, he was responsible for giving prizes to the production of pornography based on um, serial rapists. <coughs> That's right, the, um, the, the John Warboy serial taxi rapist, black cab rapist. And also something um, about um, African women arriving on, off the boat, fresh for white men to rape. The most grotesque pornography racist and misogynistic at its, obviously, in its essence. 
Um, and we walked through the university campus together, and Jeremy, the pornographer, nothing happened to him. He was laughing, because I was being picketed. I was being shouted at. I was being shouted at by these stupid students who were telling me that my presence on campus was rendering Muslim, queer, trans, bisexual, polyamorous, I kid you not, and sex working <laughs> students. I was, I was violating their safe space, and how dare I? And I said, I'd really like to talk to you about this afterwards, because this is a bit of a flip side from real feminism, where the pornographer is the one who shouted at. <laughs> so here's eight crimes. I said, but let me ask you, which article in particular do you think it is, is one that would actually cause uh, violence to these people? And they said, we haven't read any of your articles. We don't want to trigger ourselves. <laughs> Right, so, so this is the world of the university. Obviously, especially today, most university students are highly privileged. Um, there are working class young women out there who really want to, 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 um, to join proper feminism, to be outwardly proper feminists, to not have to listen to this vile anti-women rhetoric from those that now have started to say that they are us. So they are the lesbians. They are the feminists. And we know that when liberal men, or lefty men, or whoever they are, queer identified men, join forces with the women who they stand in front of them, like a human shield, we know that the reason why so many men have supported this is so they can scream whorephobe, transphobe, at the likes of me and the rest of us that are public and still be seen on the side of the progressives. They can be seen as proper, progressive, lefty men by shutting down radical feminists talking about male violence. One really important point is, every single time I've been no platform from a university, and it's always by the student union, I've been going there to talk about men's violence towards women and girls, never about the trans issue. So what does that tell you? We do need to be braver. We do need to come out uh, and be counted more. I know it's difficult, but those of us who are a bit older, or maybe who have been in feminism for longer, owe it to the newer feminists and the younger feminists. Because how on earth do we expect them to ever be involved in a cohesive, vibrant movement if they are terrified of being thrown out of their own friendship groups, their own communities? We'll be hearing more about that now in the presentation that's coming. Please let's not capitulate anymore. I understand how scary this is. And as I say, I'm speaking to the converted here because you're here and you're willing to be at an event like this. But it has taken such a long time. And there are still feminists saying, I can't have you on our programme. I can't ask you to speak at this. I can't include your name in that. Because they'll come after us. Well, let them come after us. Because we're waiting for them. <laughs>